a, a really fun class this morning. Um, they invited me to do a class on the energetics of performance, which is work that I do with um, trumpet players from all over the world that come visit my shop. Um, uh, back in the 80s, I started teaching, practicing and teaching Kundalini Yoga, and from that I've studied um, a bunch of different things, cranial sacral work, and I'm currently in training to become a Feldenkrais Christ practitioner, which is extraordinarily exciting work. I'm, so I'm just thrilled to be doing this stuff. It is so fascinating to me that people come in from all over the world, and musicians, you know, um, and artists that work in, in real time art. I mean, a painter, you know, one thing, someone that does visual art, if, if something goes wrong, you know, they can start over or paint over or something. A musician, it's in the moment, it's right now. A dancer, it's fascinating to me to work with artists who are in the moment, because it's done. They're doing it, and then the moment's gone. It's a snapshot in time. And it's fun to work with those folks. And it's fun to check out what happens with um, how the emotional stuff that they're dealing with in, in their lifetime comes out through their art. Mm -hmm. And to see the progression of people working through their emotional stuff and in the process getting to the next level of what they're trying to do artistically to spread whatever their message is to other people. It's a fascinating, fascinating, lovely process. I just love it. So uh, I put together a slideshow here of, I don't know, like 50 graphics or something to show you a little bit about what we do at my shop. And um, that kind of goes a little bit beyond uh, what you just saw in the segment that um, Carol and the crew did. Uh, I think Carol did an amazing job, and the whole crew did an unbelievable job on that segment. I'm thrilled. My whole shop was thrilled. And the shop, I showed them an advance, a private YouTube uh, a thing of the, of the segment on us. And, as soon as Scotty said, whatever the line was, I can't remember it exactly, he said, but the, the very first word spoken in the Monet segment of this hour-long TV show was something like, jazz mu music was invented by people who at the time were not even recognized as That's human right. beings yeah. by the Constitution. Yeah. When I played that for my group the other day over lunch, everybody stood up and cheered and did the big thumbs up. It's just, it's, we just love what PBS and what Craft in America is doing to help enlighten people about what's up. One of my other clients, Wynton Marcellus, you see his picture over here. Wynton uh, has a line that is also incredibly powerful, that this country is the only country, uh, possibly, that was based on the extinction of one race and the enslavement of another. Mm -hmm. Is that big? You know, and then look how that's playing out in the news and the headlines almost every week now with what's going on with all the conflicts that are happening. I mean, we don't want to get into a big thing about that right now. And, this discussion, but it's, it's so cool how the arts totally reflect what's going on in the greater world and in society and culture and all of that. And so how lucky am I that I have this gig where I get to do this stuff for a living and work with these people who are on the cutting edge and in the moment that try and um, express themselves in a way that excites and enlightens other people. It's very cool. I love it. So, um, these are two really fun decorated horns that we made for decorated presentation instruments. And um, these horns are really, really fun to make. These are kind of the, the flagship horns that we make. These are the coolest horns that we make that are about 2,000 hours a piece to make, which is uh, quite a project. And to go back 40 years from when this was made, we'll do a few slides here, but 40 years before this picture was taken, I was a high school trumpet player playing in a dance band four nights a week, four sets uh, a night, uh, four sets a night, four nights a week. And I got to be a good enough trumpet player that I realized there were all sorts of problems with the instrument that were not my fault. And it was like, you know, this is dumb. These things aren't really very good instruments. Really, they're not very high on the evolutionary scale of musical instruments. So when I, back in when I was in high school, uh, the standard for a professional trumpet player was to send to New York to a store called Giardinelli in New York. Some of you musicians may know about the old Giardinelli store. And uh, people would buy the best trumpet you could buy for $450, and it was mass produced. I think it was not good. It was not happening. And I knew it wasn't happening to the point that I gave up the trumpet for a couple of years. I just said, okay, screw this. This isn't my fault. It's too much work. I want to be able to sound better and not have to work so hard. Something's got to happen with the instrument. So I ended up doing this gig. Mm. And I do this gig with a fun team of, of uh, co-workers. There's about 10 of us at my shop. 
Uh, everyone that works for me, as I said in the earlier video, was a client, trumpet player and client before they came to work for me. So that makes everything really easy because we're all on the same page. And uh, yeah, here's my shop foreman, Dean Willoughby, who's just, if NASA came to him and said, we need you to build a Mars rover, can you help us? He could do it. I mean, this guy, this guy is just out of control. He's just unbelievable. And John, the mouthpiece maker. I'd like to talk about everybody in my shop, but we don't have time. But, but John, the mouthpiece maker and uh, uh, the CNC lathe operator. What a brain this guy has. There's a thousand different mouthpiece designs in my own personal laptop computer. This guy knows the numbers of almost all of those designs. It's uh, mind boggling. So here I am, whatever it is, 40 years ago or whatever it was, a uh, high school trumpet player trying to figure out how to sound better without having to practice much. Uh -huh. So anyway, so just for perspective, uh, here is almost 100 years of trumpets that one would find in a music store. And you notice, they all look the same. Imagine that. Tradition is a big deal in the human condition. It's a really big deal in making musical instruments. And I came into the world of making trumpets when the industry standard was to make trumpets that you would find in a music store that looked exactly like they did 100 years before. So my timing was good. The other thing is uh, trumpet mouthpieces. This is a trumpet mouthpiece made by the Besson Company in the turn of the century, 1900. And this mouthpiece is, looks just like mouthpieces. If you go down the store to a music store and look at the trumpet mouthpieces they sell, they look just like this mouthpiece. Again, 100 years later, nothing's changed. But the, the interesting part of that is, is that, um, go back for a second, that these mouthpieces were designed, you know, for turn, last turn of the century, 115 years ago or so, when trumpets were built in the key of A, they were longer by a half step musical tone than the trumpets made now. But because tradition is so strong, music stores and instrument manufacturers today, today still make mouthpieces that are imitations and copies of mouthpieces designed for trumpets pitched in A. <laughs> but now, most trumpet players you see on TV and jazz players and things play trumpets pitched a half step higher in B flat. Well, the problem is when you play a mouthpiece that does not acoustically match the key of instrument you're playing, it's just horribly out of tune and god awful. <laughs> and most trumpet uh, teachers today, in my opinion, have to spend half of their time teaching technical exercises and repetitive memory muscle exercises so players can get used to physically compensating in their body for the fact that they're playing a mouthpiece that was designed 115 years ago for an instrument in a different key than the person is trying to play now. This is crazy. This is just crazy. And if you say this to the people making the instruments now or mouthpieces, many of them would say, oh, well, Eddie doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, so the world's a big place and there's room for a lot of different ideas. One of the things that's interesting to me when I first started working and doing this work was I knew that I had to be able to get myself in my physical body to neutral so that as I played up and down through the instrument, I didn't have to make adjustments like as shown in this photo. Um, so I started uh, doing Kundalini Yoga and I started studying the Alexander Technique which is similar to and kind of a warm up, in my opinion, to the Feldenkrais method, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So it occurred to me, starting out uh, when I first started making instruments, that it would be a big deal to imagine this. I know this is a novel concept, even for people who aren't musicians, but imagine this, that you might want to make a mouthpiece of a certain length to match the certain length of instrument that you were playing. So I made mouthpieces for B flat trumpet, C trumpet, E trumpet, E flat trumpet, etc. The shorter the horn, the shorter the mouthpiece, and acoustically match the length exactly to within a thousandth of an inch or so, so that the instrument would play evenly from top to bottom. And here's the bottom line. There's not a wind instrument made on the planet that I'm aware of, that I'm aware of with that caveat, that you can play from soft to loud without having the pitch go high or low as you play as you change the hammer. Or, or is there a wind instrument made anywhere on the face of the planet that I'm aware of that you can play from, um, not just from low to high, but from soft to loud? So the dynamic range, when you play soft to loud, the pitch changes. The, the range over the instrument from low to high, the pitch changes. So players have to learn to do these complex adjustments in their body, raising their shoulders, bobbing their head up and down, locking their hips, to the point where they, they turn themselves into pretzels trying to play, and the problem with that is, is that the more tension you hold in your body, the less sound reaches the audience. And those of you that are performers know this. 
especially if you're a string player or a vocalist, because this is taught to people that play real instruments as opposed to these young instruments that are brass instruments where the teachers spend most of their time just trying to figure out how to teach people how to do muscle memory exercises to compensate. Oh, brother. <laughs> So here's my friend who's one of the premier Alexander Technique teachers on the planet, John Hennis, working with one of my clients. John has got the most magic hands. He's just unbelievable. He's done lots of workshops at my shop. We had him come in and work with players individually and give group classes because he's just a genius at getting people quickly with just you know, five grams of pressure here and there at the right point, and he can get somebody to align and just sound beautifully. Like just for example, I'm going to collapse myself a little bit. Listen to the sound of my voice right now. Listen to the timbre, listen to the pitch, listen to how my voice projects. If John Hennis was here, in about 30 seconds, John would get me to sit like this, and I'm talking the same, and listen to the difference in my voice. Because now I'm talking more with my entire body, there's less tension in my body, so more of my full body is a resonance chamber, and boom, the sound projects. It's lovely work. But if you're playing an instrument that encourages you to be all tight and clamped in a pretzel, then there's this big conflict. And that's what motivated me to make instruments in a different way than they had been made before. Does that make sense? Yes. So on the uh, mouthpiece thing, once I figured out constant pitch center in the mouthpiece, as opposed to the 100 years of conventional trumpets that you saw before, here's 10 years of the evolution of one trumpets. And things moved quickly from 87 to 97. We went from an instrument that kind of looks conventional to an instrument that's not even close to conventional, which has two bells and an integral built-in mouthpiece. And why can we do the integral built-in mouthpiece? Because finally the mouthpiece was good enough that it could be built into the horn. You didn't need to change depending on the type of music you were playing because it just played in tune no matter what you were doing. Imagine that. Novel concept. So it's fun to check out how my hobbies totally, completely informed how I design instruments. One of my hobbies is I'm a private pilot, and I love to go flying. And the FAA doesn't like it or even say that it's legal, but cloud surfing is my favorite. <laughs> and there's a tremendous amount to learn from flying about designing uh, wind instruments in band instruments in that it's all about air pressure and manipulating air pressure in the relationship between dynamic air pressure and static air pressure Whereas in the case of an airplane, um, when you control static and dynamic air pressure over a wing of an airplane, it creates lift, and the airplane flies. When you control static and dynamic air pressure over the length of a brass instrument by changing the tapers and the inside diameters and building special pockets into the instrument, you can totally optimize the uh, fluid mechanics, it's called in physics, the flow of air through the instrument to optimize how the instrument vibrates, make it vibrate in a more happy way, and then more communication happens. Here's an example of the tuning slide from an old-fashioned horn like you saw in the picture, the 100 years of trumpets that haven't changed. This is what the tuning slides look like. This is a tuning slide out of one head trumpet. I'm one more head trumpet anyway. And you notice it's radically different. And you notice that the bend, the curve here, is <coughs> ornate. So this is kind of a fun story. My grandfather, when I was seven or eight years old, Swiss inventor, lived, moved over from Switzerland, lived in Chicago. My grandfather, I was, I was seven or eight years old, and I'm in his basement, and he was a consultant for the burns matic Turner Torch Company. And he had this torch tip that was milled in half, and you could see the channel that the air, the propane went through on his torch tip. And he, and he holds this thing up to me. I'm seven years old, and he was like dictatorial, old school, Right, Swiss guy, and, and he looks at me and he says, so, what is this? It's like, I don't know. You know, I felt like saying, I don't know, I'm seven, what is it? I don't know what this is. <laughs> well, so what he, was, what he was showing, he was showing me the ovate shape on the inside of the torch tip, because in fluid mechanics and physics, when you're air and you're moving around a corner, if you go through a corner that is a soft turn going into a hard turn, it speeds up. It's a pump. Just like squeezing the end of the garden hose and you get less water but it goes out further, it's a pump. So the exact shape on any instrument that carries air through it, is a wind instrument, has everything in the world to do with the fluid mechanics or how the air flows through the instrument which radically changes like that fast the resonance of the instrument, how it feels, how it plays, how it responds, how much room on each overtone there is to bend each, each note up and down before it cracks to the next higher or lower overtone, that kind of thing. So between the mouthpieces and my grandfather's information from the torch tip, when I finally got it figured out years later, we can build instruments that look very unconventional and are really, really cool. 
Another hobby I have, God help me, is the geek thing, is I'm a ham radio operator. And the thing that's so fun about ham radio for me is that it, it, is, uh, it involves a communication system that is radio frequency energy. Okay? So, um, in a radio frequency circuit, you have various components that need to resonate and be impedance matched so that communication can happen. So here's an amplifier that I'm building for my ham radio station. It's kind of fun. All handmade parts, it's all a blast to do. It's fun to, to see how this goes together. But in the music world, we also have circuits of components. And in audio frequency music world, the components of this resonant circuit are the player, the mouthpiece, the instrument, the room, and then the audience, and then that circuit connects back to the player. And as those of you who know, those of you that know who are musicians, the whole gig is bringing the information in, spreading it out to the audience, getting feedback from the audience so that it's a closed circuit and it's like a loop. And then the communication happens and the magic happens and everybody's happy and they go home feeling like, wow, that was amazing. Right? And um, we're very fortunate at my shop that we get to do these private concerts. We have the best players in the world that come into my shop often and they do concerts for us, private concerts. We get rid of as many uh, benches and equipment, as, as much equipment as we can, and uh, we set up as many chairs as we can, and we do small group uh, improvisational jazz concert. This is with Marcellus, he's played at my shop maybe three times. Scotty, who you saw in the segments, played at my shop, I don't know, 15 times, private concerts. Lots of folks have been in. Lovely guitarist, Bill Frizzell has been in with one of my clients. Bill's unbelievable. We get to hear spectacular music in my shop, and I love it. So again, just to keep going with the ham radio thing, transmitter, feed line, antenna. Transmitter, feed line, antenna. It's the same thing. This is radio frequency. This is audio frequency. Right? Same thing, though. Tune each part of the circuit to resonance. Impedance match the parts, and you have efficient communication, which is what we're trying to do. And part of the efficient communication in the transmitter is to get the transmitter, or as we already talked about, the, the body, the player, aligned so that there's no tension in the body, so that there can be maximum forward, uh, forward power and very little reflected power or resistance. This is in ham radio, this is called an SWR meter, a standing wave ratio meter which just measures how much, uh, how efficient a circuit is. How, how much, uh, uh, how efficient is the energy going out for communication. And what happens when a player blocks up and gets all misaligned, everything just dies. The forward power just dies, and the reflected power and all the resistance massively increases and very little music can happen. Very little real communication can happen. This was what Alexander of the Alexander Technique discovered. This fellow named Alexander was an actor in England, I don't know when, a zillion years ago, I don't know, 80, 100 years ago. Alexander developed his technique because he couldn't get a gig as an actor. And so he set up mirrors and he realized, oh, I sound bad and I look bad. And so he would work on realigning himself and getting the tension out of his body and then he would hear his voice project more. So instead of using that to go get a gig as an actor, he decided, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to help other people. And the Alexander technique happened. And he and a guy named Feldenkrais hooked up. I don't know when. Forgive me. I don't know when. I should know this. I don't know when. In the, maybe in the 40s or something. I'm not sure. Is that right? I think so. Irene wouldn't know. She's a Feldenkrais practitioner with us today. Anyway, so, so uh, it's fascinating, uh, a fascinating thing for me. And this is how yoga ties into another one of my hobbies, ties into all of this. Because yoga is... Uh, the practice and the school of techniques of making yourself complete and integrated from head to toe. Yoga means yoke, it means union, it means completion. And the yoga thing is a very big deal. So I've taught yoga for brass players classes all over the world. <laughs> Japan, we taught a class for Japan years ago, 400 people with a translator in Tokyo. It was insane. This was down in Brazil. We had a bunch of folks at a music festival in Brazil. And we do physical things to help them align and get their body moving and be able to breathe so that they can be more of a resonance chamber when they pick up an instrument and play. And here's Winton playing his decorated Samani horn. And one of the things that's fun about working with the best players on the planet is we get to really stretch things kind of in terms of 
Uh, it gets a little bit of woo-woo kind of sometimes working with these folks. Like for Winton, as I said in the, in the uh, segment, the Craft in America segment, anytime I can figure out how to build a better horn for Winton, he doesn't order it, I just build it. And then I show up. Is, it, is, that, is the bell perforated? The outer bell yeah, is. There's two bells. We'll yeah. talk about this in just a moment. Okay. But good, good, oh, good eye. Yeah. So there's an outer bell and there's an inner bell. Oh. So the instrument is coaxial. And we'll talk about this in just a minute. So it's really, really fun then to talk about the yoga thing. The Yoga Sutras is kind of a Bible for me. And the Yoga Sutras talks about, um, among other things, it talks about the three dynamics of living in the material world, in this, in this life of karma that we have. And the dynamics are the three energies of um, rajas, tamas, and, uh, uh, excuse me, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And what that means is simply the energy of inspiration, the energy of what gets in the way of manifesting inspiration, all the, all the crap you got to wait through, the hoops that you have to jump through, and then um, Rajas is the, is the energy of blasting through all the crap that's in the way and manifesting what's really going on. Take the inspiration and make it real so that other people can enjoy it. And it, it, it becomes grounded in three-dimensional reality. And that's a cool thing that I get to do, and it's lovely, a, a lovely thing that I get to do in building instruments and working with players. And the reason that this is worth talking about is because Raja Yoga gets into the thing of what, how, how I work with clients to figure out what the next best horn will be, which is this. And this might be the most important thing that I'll tell you today, maybe. What I do is I go listen to Winton, or I go listen to Charlie Schluter, or I go listen to Scotty, or whoever it is that's a great player, so that the player isn't an issue. All I'm hearing is the player interact with their instrument, and the player's so good, the player really doesn't have any problems. Then I analyze the various parts of sound. Oh, there's my yoga teachers with Winton and me, way back when. I analyze the various parts of sound uh, in a brass instrument. There's five basic parts, and I listen to these five parts, tone shape, tone color, tone density, tone clarity, tone definition, all these different parts. I listen to how those parts interact as I'm listening to a Winton play or Scotty play or whatever, and then I imagine, I go to the future and imagine, okay, if they're playing the next better horn, or the best way to think of it is, if the horn is, if we take the horn to the next level of just getting out of, out of the way, how are they gonna sound when they sound better in the future when there's less junk in the way? And then I listen to that sound. As I'm listening to them in real time, I imagine how they sound in the future. And I hear how they sound in the future when everything's better. Then the difference in the parts, these five parts of sound that I hear in the future compared to how I hear when I'm sitting in the audience actually listening to them informs me exactly of the physical components of what to build into the instrument. How do I change the physical design of the horn to optimize the combination of these five parts of sound in a way that they get to the next thing? So it's about going to the future, seeing what's going on, and bringing the future into the now. It's, it's really fun. It's really, really cool. And I love doing this work with clients. I love doing this, this work with clients. It's fun to work with a client who's coming in and he's having a little bit of a problem, and we just do a little guided meditation to go to the future so that he can hear what he sounds like or she sounds like in the future when things are better. We set the template for how it is in the future. We do this guided meditation. It's just lovely work. Irene and I uh, did a little bit of this just a little bit ago. It was very, very fun. She's so easy to work with. Feldenkrais practitioner, they're so easy to work with. It's just like nothing. And it's, it's fun to do that. And in five or 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, the difference in how someone sounds before and after can be like they went somewhere and practiced for six months. And I do this with people and the guys that have workbenches by my bench where I work with clients. For, you know, for years they've heard this. Somebody comes in and they're having problems and we do this meditation stuff and we get the container aligned a little bit so they've got a home to go to. And uh, we turn them around and then boom, all of a sudden it's like, wow, what happened? It's phenomenally rewarding work. I love it. So here's uh, some cool instruments that we make. This is a uh, flu horn. Winton's office called about five years ago or so and said, Winton needs a flugelhorn, what can you do? So I decided, okay, it's time to completely redesign the modern flugelhorn, and this is it. Kind of looks like the Jetsons flugelhorn, if you know what a flugelhorn normally looks like. 
Another instrument we made for Ron Miles, I actually named after the first Guna. Remember we said inspiration, all the crap that gets in the way of inspiration and blasting through and reeling, <coughs> realizing the inspiration, the three Gunas from the Yoga Sutras. This is named after the inspiration, the first Guna, the first dynamic, which is inspiration. It's this Tasatva, pitched in low G, which I um, designed and built, kind of invented for our buddy Ron Miles. Ron is a friend of Winton's. Ron lives in Denver, kind of cutting edge avant-garde jazz trumpet player, just stunning player, we love Ryan. There's an instrument we call the Rajna, combination of the words Raja, which is the highest form of yoga, and Ajna, which is the third eye, where psychics get information. The Rajna, integral mouthpiece, solid opal inlays, which we're gonna see more of in a little bit. Sheet bracing, the whole instrument's quite heavy, so the bracing on the instrument needs to be correspondingly as heavy, which is why there's sheet bracing all over the horn, and it looks like Again, like the Jetsons trumpet instead of the trumpets you normally see in our bonnets. There's uh, Wint Marcellus again with, with the, the, these two people are probably influenced the design of more uh, bonnet trumpets more than anyone. Wint Marcellus and Charlie Schluter, this is 1990 when they both got, the year they both got their first Raja instruments, which are the first instruments that we made with integral mouthpieces. So instead of a trumpet and a mouthpiece, there's only one thing between the player and the audience. That is, unless you're an orchestral musician and you count the conductor. Yeah. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> so anyway, this is kind of fun. These are the threaded integral mouthpieces. They're threaded, so they could be changed. But then when you thread them in, they are really in the way. Watch this. And, ooh. I mean, it's machine. This is, this is John and Peter Willoughby. Uh, the folks I showed you earlier, that's the machining. That, John Kim goes on the CNC lathe. I mean, it's just, I mean, you saw it, it's just perfect. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Now, somebody asked me about, you asked me about the, uh, what's going on is the bell pierced. So here's a decorated presentation instrument, which we talked about a little bit in the, in the PBS video, in the Craft in America video. So this instrument, integral mouthpiece, two bells, lots of sound posts connecting the inner and outer bells. It usually takes about two weeks to place the sound posts. Two weeks of work just to place the sound posts when the instrument's done to optimize everything and get everything really flying here. For perspective, if you go down the street to the music store, the trumpet you see in the window took five to eight hours to make. We have two weeks into just placing sound posts between those two bells. Really labor intensive. And again, the coaxial thing, back when I was a kid, I did the ham radio thing, and those of us in the audience that are old enough to remember before there was cable TV and after cable TV, when cable TV came in, the reception got way better, didn't it? Oh, yeah. And it's because this is coax, so you have a center conductor that carries the signal, and then an outer braid that contains the signal so that the feed line doesn't radiate, it contains the signal till it gets to where it wants to be so that you can really hear it. And that's what these... Samadhi instruments, we call. That's what the Samadhi instruments do. It's coaxial, outer bell, inner bell. The outer bell, you notice it kind of looks like the braid. It's pierced. This one is braced with uh, actually pierced trumpet release. You'll see more of that in a moment. And um, so yeah, so the outer bell channels the sound. It kills unwanted vibration and da by damping and throws the sound forward. These instruments start to sound good at about 80 to 100 feet. Up close, they don't sound as good because the sound is just way out there. Same thing as cable TV. Instead of just being stuck by being able to watch a TV station that's 20 or 30 miles away with your antenna on the roof with cable, you can watch a TV station across the country because it's more efficient. And you've got signal transmission. Here you see, the, here you see uh, uh, Charlie Schluter's uh, most recent decorated uh, presentation samadhi, and you can see the inner bell and you can see the outer bell. And the light at the plating company was such that the inner bell really picked up the gold beautifully. It's 24 karat gold plated. You can really see. It's very, really, very really stunning. Mm -hmm. I love this picture. So how does it affect the sound effect if the outer and the inner are solid? Is it necessary to have it perforated? The, the perfor it, just, it just all depends on how you place the sound post and how thick the metal is and what's the temper of the metal. Everything affects everything, and it's just like a... It's just like a formula. So and you can change one thing, but you gotta change everything else to keep some kind of a balance and an impedance match going. Otherwise, so are you it works a big mess. Are you working backwards, in this case, from the decoration? How? In other words, does someone say, I want these sorts of perforations in the outer bell, therefore you have to reverse engineer? They don't get to say. 
<laughs> so we build what we want to build. Yeah. They come to us, we listen to them play, and then we build. I mean, we're very fortunate. We get to just build what we want to build. But you said they they uh, uh, tell you what they want in the horn. What what is it that you hear from? Let's they, say wind they, or something. They, Winston and I never talk about what he wants in a horn. Never. We've never had the discussion because we don't have to. And I usually I just don't have that discussion. I mean, I wouldn't have a gig if I couldn't hear how they sound and know how they could sound better and then build them better. And if I can't do that, I don't have a gig. So there's not much of a discussion to have. The other thing is, most musicians, I'm an industrial trumpet player, and I'm an industrial music listener. So when I listen to a trumpet or any instrument, I listen to parts of the sound and then hear the relationship between the parts of the sound, which is why I showed you that graphic with the, you know, density and clarity and concentration and shape and all of that, talking about the different parts of the sound. It's my gig to know how somebody can sound better and then build it. And I'm very fortunate, it's been 32 years and so people just come to me and they say, build me a horn. We say, okay. Sometimes Not I listen to them. trumpets are uh, B-flat trumpets, you said. Uh, they're Various pitches. Various keys, yeah. The, the one, uh, this horn is John Reese horn, that's a C trumpet. He played this in the Boston Symphony, his principal trumpet. And uh, yeah, so we have trumpets. Uh, typically we make usually just B flat and C trumpets, but we make flugel horns. We make an instrument called the flumpet, which you'll see in a minute, which I invented for a jazz player named Art Farmer. And that was very fun. The saw piercing that we do, uh, Tammy Dean does. My, my good buddy Tammy Dean is the one with the little tiny jeweler saw that saw pierces the icons that you saw on the TV show. Uh, this is Tammy at her bench, and she's a genius. I just turn everything loose to her to design the icons in these decorated presentation instruments. If you didn't get it, the icons, the, the purpose of the icons is to tell the life story of the player as a soul retrieval. Who were their heroes? Who were their family members? Who were their mentors? Who were their friends? Who were the people that made them and contributed karmically to who they are in their life? And then let's represent them on the horn in a place on the horn that makes sense and is appropriate, which is why, for example, Dr. King would be at the low, the back vertical brace at the lowest part, part on Scotty's horn closest to his heart. And then Winton is the most elevated. He's the most recent, and he's at the top of the brace because And your name is on the mouthpiece. My, my name is on the instrument. And on the <laughs> yeah, it is. So I thought I'd show you a few pictures of close-ups of the decorated presentation instruments. We really, I, I love making these things. They're, they're, they're really a nightmare to make, I gotta say. But they're really fun. And this particular instrument, this was the first time I did the inlay here. And if you notice, that ring isn't very big. And that inlay was really a trip to do. It was a trip to cut the stone and fit it and have it look perfect and inlay it. And I kind of had to develop the technique to do that. And I thought it was so cool after I finally, I, I didn't know if I could do it, but it worked. And so I made a video of how I did it and posted it on the Facebook page, the company Facebook page. There's tens of thousands of views to see, how the hell did he do that? <laughs> so the craft thing, right? Does, does the inlay affect the resonance? Everything affects yeah, so everything. So you got everything. Yeah, I guess it <laughs> That's why, that's why somebody asked me one time, they said, so how do you design an instrument? And I got about five minutes into the explanation and said, okay, I give up. It's, it's too much, too much to, it's too much, I don't have the ability to verbalize it, it's too much. But on the good days, I do have the ability when I'm in the zone to, to have it up here, which is good. Look at a couple other pictures. Oh, wow. This is an instrument that, that was commissioned by the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. They call this the Elysian Trumpet, and it was meant to, to um, celebrate uh, the city of New Orleans as a cultural center for jazz, and also to celebrate the uh, victims of Hurricane Katrina. Elysian Fields, right? Greek mythology, yeah. everything, right? So, and the fellow that commissioned this, Urban Mayfield, who uh, leads the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, his father passed away from Katrina, and his father's body was found on Elysian Fields Avenue. It's like, okay, we're calling this thing the Elysian Trumpet. Mm -hmm. And it's a trippy horn, it's pretty fun. There's Urban with Tammy and myself when he took delivery of the instrument. He came to my shop, and then they come to the shop and do concerts. He came and played a private concert, which was very fun. There's the Mississippi River. Now, I, didn't do, I do a lot of the inlay, but this is Tammy's inlay. She did the Mississippi River, 
uh, inlaid into the mouthpiece. And that is the shape of the Mississippi River exactly as it goes through the city of New Orleans. And the Red Ruby there is where the Superdome is and, uh, and also where Louis Armstrong Park is, which was uh, Congo Square. Big. You know about Congo Square back in the day where the slaves unloaded in New Orleans? Quite a vibe. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So we wanted to honor that with a big faceted Red Ruby. Then New Orleans Mardi Gras colors uh, get laid into the, into the bottom valve caps, right? Precious and semi-precious stones. Another view of the instrument, all the saw piercing and decorations. Yeah. This is kind of our rendition of the shape of some of the wrought iron work and the balconies of houses around New Orleans we can visit there, so we're trying to recreate some stuff. Now to go sideways, here's some inlay work that I did. This is the first time I ever tried to carve stone to do inlay finger buttons. And they I couldn't believe it, they turned out. It worked. This is the view of Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where this customer that I made these for, he had this view from his, from his family home where he grew up. So I decided, all right, let's do the view of the mountain in three different seasons. And so this is at night, this is obviously winter, and this is you know, sunset. It's really a trip to do that with this, these tiny little diamond files carved in the stone. I'm like, oh God. While I was doing this, it's like, am I ever going to be done with this project? <laughs> There's some uh, um, Lightning Ridge Black Opal. And I scored a once in a lifetime deal on two chunks of rubs, they call them, of Lightning Ridge Black Opal. It's not cut opal, they're just partially cut, you know, roughed out. And I scored these two pieces for an unbelievable deal. I think it was only $3,000 for these two chunks of raw opal. And then I cut these finger buttons and we sold them. This particular set went to a client that lives in Australia. He said, well, what, what better place? Yeah. The opal's yeah. from Australia, let's yeah. sell So um, I made almost nothing making these, these opal inlays. And then I was a new stone setter. I'd only been setting stones and cutting opal for about a year. And I didn't know that that opal, that this opal was a once, literally a once in a lifetime find. Wow. I mean, this opal, no one can afford this opal. Certainly no musicians. So then in, Pat, in the previous year, uh, future years, I would go to the Tucson Rock and Mineral, Mineral Show, the largest show on earth. You know about yes. And I would go see uh, people from Lightning Ridge and from Australia, and I'd say, I need, I need more of this opal. Yeah. And, he, and the local dealers would say, well, when you made these, when you cut these, first of all, it's unbelievable. How much did you charge for those? And I said, well, I charged just over the cost of the material, about $3,000. And they just went. <laughs> <laughs> oh they said, you didn't charge fifteen dollars to $20,000 for those? And I said, no. Okay. Because I didn't know. Yeah. But anyway, it's cool. Collectors, I understand. Yeah, and it, and it went to musicians, so it's all, it's all good. And they look real pretty. Here's some other inlay that I did. I decided to start doing intarsia inlay with um, various pieces of stone. And then you see some of the stones have curves in them, which again is interesting because as you cut the inside curve and the outside curve, the radius needs to match perfectly so that there's no gap between the stones. And again, I, didn't, I always kind of wanted to work, do stone work, but well, even when I made these, I'd only done stone work for about a year or two. I just, I just like being left alone and be on the bench. It's just fun to do. It's What's that? Just let me work. Yeah, just, yeah. And it's, it's cool to do. It's very fun. Here's some other ones. This is uh, Lapis, uh, Tiger Eye, and Malachite. Fun. Here's uh, Mark McDowell's carving on one of the decorated presentation instruments. He carved the first bow slide ring. That's hand carved. And I don't know how, I think that took him about a week to carve that. Mm. It's that really, all? It's re it's, yeah, is that all? Yeah. Yeah, a first valve slide ring on a trumpet that you buy in a music store is a part that's usually made in China or something that costs some manufacturer 25 cents or 30 cents or something. You know, I, I, he worked on this a really long time. That ring, it costs thousands of dollars. In, in, it's all labor, it's all time carving. But they're cool horns, we want to do it up. Here's Shelly Hendler's, the front of Shelly Hendler's horn. Uh, Shelly, uh, was an amazing fellow. I could go on for 10 minutes about Shelley, but I won't. He was an amazing uh, PhD chemist, MD, researcher, uh, lead researcher at the Salk Institute. Amazing, amazing fella. And he did weird connections here. I'm currently in Feldenkrais practitioner training. Shelley was uh, 
did a lecture series all over the country with a brilliant, genius man named Stanley Kellerman. And uh, Stanley and Shelley Hendler worked very closely together, and both just incredible people. This is Shelley. Shelley was an amateur trumpet player. We made him a decorated presentation instrument. Shelley lost his um, 18 or 19 year old son in a car wreck. And um, he always referred to that son, he and his wife Joyce referred to the son as their shooting star. So on the front of his instrument, leading him as he plays, is his shooting star. This is his son, represented in, this is meteorite. Yeah, because it's a shooting star, right? And then this is the, the first uh, bar of the tune, I Remember Clifford. Mm -hmm. And an tune, just a beautiful tune. And a more Marx carving, ring carving. Here's an instrument, if you remember, I mentioned Ron Miles to you earlier that I invented the Satva for. Well, this is the cornet that Ron Miles now plays. Radical design, nothing like this has ever been seen in the world of cornets before. I had this, I drew this design out on a piece of cardboard, a big piece of cardboard on our break room table, and it sat there for uh, the better part of a year because there was a piece to this puzzle that I hadn't figured out. I was like, okay, this is going to be really cool, but I just don't have it. Then in meditation one day, it was like, oh shit, I got it. And it was the mouthpiece needed to be radically different than anything that had ever been made for a cornet mouthpiece before, and that was the last piece of the puzzle. In these projects, when we do something new, it's really interesting, because in meditation, it's like the pieces of the puzzle that would make something new are like scattered all over, and then the pieces start to come closer together, and then they start to rotate and get oriented so that they might fit together, and then at a certain point in meditation, it's like, boom. Oh, okay, time to build the horn. That's what happened to the mouthpiece design on this instrument. Dean Willoughby and I sweated over this horn, man. My shop foreman and I, we sat at the, our break room table in our, in our break room we call the design department. And it's my favorite place in the shop, probably, because Dean and I get to sit there and throw ideas back and forth about what we might do and how we might get the sound in the future that we want to hear into the now. And this instrument is an example of that. Here's Shelley's decorated presentation flumpet. The flumpet is an instrument that I invented for jazz legend Art Farmer. And we love these instruments. Scotty uh, plays one on, the, on his album, actually. I think on the, that beautiful ballad he plays, Dedicated to You. I think he's playing flumpet on that album, on that tune. Here's my Swiss grandfather, John A. Kern. And he's the one that uh, wanted me to figure out what was going on with the torch tip before he was ready to do it. Amazing. And he's right there with me all the time, right over my shoulder all the time. Unbelievable help to me, still today. And there's my dad. My dad was a forward observer of World War II, and uh, he had to do Morse code. I get to do Morse code as a hobby because I'm a ham radio operator. One generation ago, he did Morse code in his life and everyone else's life depended on it. He was a, little, it was a forward observer with a radio on his back in the Battle of the Bulge. So what a difference one generation makes. It's crazy. Anyway, and I think that's 